Morning, everybody. Welcome to Siren Song Session. This is a yellow tea, and according to the advertising you got, it's a mysterious yellow tea. So by the end of this session, we should be able to get rid of most of the mystery for you. So that's one of the expectations of this session. As usual, I want to open up a little bit with general news. The general news is tea is going to be harder and harder to come by, especially this premium tea. So thank you, Rob Dorfman, for sharing the Upton catalog. One of the things that he noted in the catalog is, generally speaking, Chinese teas are prominently featured right in the beginning. They're shifting their place in the catalog. They're going towards the rear. Perhaps that is because the quality of tea is going down? Oh, no. It's because the ability to get the tea is going away. And we're seeing this more and more through more and more people who are contacting us and asking us if we might be able to provide tea for them. So this is one of the things you got to be aware of. And the other part of that is, as you find teas you love, buy them and keep them <clears throat> because we don't know what the tea industry is going to look like over this next year. Zero COVID is bad for the tea industry. And the reason for that is because workers can't get to some of the farms. And so some of these are not being harvested in the way they normally would be. Price of tea is going through the roof, but even more important, the price of transportation, the price of logistics, the price of inspection, all of those are vastly increasing. That's just the world we live in right now. All right, so let's go ahead and start right into Siren Song, a yellow tea. Now I've got to give history, I have to give some production information. And I think what we're going to start with is history, because there's a lot of missed history about yellow tea. So you got websites that somehow talk about yellow tea as if it's just something that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? The answer would be no, that's false. The earliest yellow tea, as far as we know, was sometime around the 1700s, probably earlier 1700s than later 1700s. And we'll talk about why that may have arisen. One of the things we know for sure is where do all these complicated processes really originate? Is it that the farmer gets up one morning and says, okay, I am going to develop a really complicated process. It's going to taste delicious. The emperor will love me and bestow riches upon me. Well, that's not right. We know from the cliff teas that that really developed through temple support, Buddhist and Taoist. Yellow tea looks to us about the same. Buddhist and Taoist cooperated and helped produce this incredible process. We don't know, by the way, for sure what the original process looked like because there's not good documentation of it. We know it's probably different than what's used today, but we're not sure exactly how it's different. So let's go through the steps of doing yellow tea. And in fact, you know, last week you caught me over talking. We're not going to do that this week. This week, we're going to, and, and I allow you all to get thirsty. This week, we're going to start right on out. And by the way, 
I remind you to take good notes because next week we're going to do old gold, which is another yellow tea in a different style. And you're going to see a huge difference in flavor profiles. Yes. Are your tea friends safe with the flooding in Southern China? As far as we know, our tea friends are completely safe in spite of the flooding. It appears most of the farms that we're dealing with aren't in the lowlands and they're not in the areas where you would have a lot of difficulty unless you had a typhoon run right through the fields. So thank you for the question. All right, so I'm gonna ask Xiaobei to come and start the brewing process with you. And as she's demonstrating, and as we actually go through this process, I'll walk you through the production process and we're gonna eliminate the mystery of yellow tea. And I'll look for some big words to prove that I'm right also. So without further ado, let me bring in the not so thirsty tea master, Xiao Bei. Okay. Hey, good morning. Everybody. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Zasan Hao. Yeah. So we do Huang Cha. Huang Cha. So I call Huang Cha, but here American call yellow tea. Okay, I like the English yellow tea. <laughs> okay. So yeah. Um uh, so later. So look at how it's everybody like my side, so you can copy. So Usually, I used to big glasses. It's easy, right? Yes, sweater. Uh, this is my style. I always like to play. Okay, let's just help me. Yeah, so this is the tableau, opening tableau. Remembering that this is going to be 175 degree water, so you should already start to get your water going. And we're going to go through the normal routine where you heat the cups, make sure that they're absolutely clean, and you also dissipate the steam in the water, what I call structuring the water. Does the tea toy have a function besides fun and charm? So the question is, does the tea toy have any other use aside from looking beautiful and interesting? So technically, the real question is, could you brew this tea without the tea toy? And the answer is absolutely yes. It is more for fun than it is for function. However, tea toys, as you develop your tea practice, help you slow down because as you're putting water on the tea toys, that reminds you there's reasons you're doing everything. But is it required? Absolutely not. You don't have to have a tea toy in order to make great tea. Remembering that as the tea master structures this water, dissipates the steam, reduces the temperature, really, this is all in preparation for the first step, which will be to heat the leaves. And if you're going to air, if you don't have a reliable source of heated water, in other words, something that doesn't tell you the temperature, remember to air on the side of cooler rather than hotter. All right, so the tea master gets the little baggie of tea, does one last check on the water, puts the dry tea leaves in the hot cup, shakes, and she's trying to get the heat, uh, tea leaves heated because as you heat them, you start to get the original aroma. And as you get that aroma, that's the first step in starting to understand the tea. 
She pours on the side. You try not to pour directly on the leaves. But if you miss, don't worry about it. Set the timer for two minutes. Okay. So she's going to fill that cup all the way up to the top. I believe. There we go. It is beautiful. The, how is this tea processed? Well, first off, it's grown in a very famous area. Actually, it's grown in several famous areas in China. This particular tea is grown in an extremely famous area in Anhui province. Anhui has lots and lots of green teas. It's famous for its uh, chiman and all the other varietals that are like Chiman or come from the Chiman area. And it's also famous for this yellow tea that comes from Dajai. And this area is producing any number of teas. So let's go through the processing of it. So what's the farmer do to begin with? Well, gotta pick. No matter what you start out picking, what pick are they gonna use? depends on what you're doing. If you're doing Junshan needle, which is the most famous of the yellow teas, and we've done a session on that before, you're picking the bud and a small attached leaf, just barely coming out. If you're picking this, you're doing a bud and two leaves. After you pick, you bring it into the farm and you wither. Now, again, on that really outstanding source of information that we all rely on. What's that called again? Oh, yeah, the internet. You see descriptions. Oh, they wither for 15 minutes. Oh, they wither for two hours. Oh, they wither for half a day. Which is it? But depends on the farm, doesn't it? So there is no authoritative answer to that. What it is, is by farmer. And what it is, but what determines is their experience and the variety. All right, the timer went off. That was a two minute steeping. Tea master separates the leaves from the tea liquor. And your tea, when you do it, should look this shape. All right, let's see if this stuff is any good. And we're going to enter the quality arena first. So the first thing we're going to do is, after looking at the leaves, we're going to smell these leaves. Remember, it's 175 degree steeping, so we can actually take a, a little bit bigger uh, aroma. And we're not in a hurry to do this. We're trying to really get some baseline understanding through this. All right, I have a baseline understanding. Tea liquor should look like this. And now I'm gonna go ahead and do quality arena assessment. So we're gonna take 175 degree sip we're going to let the tea coat the tongue, and we're going to be aware of aftertaste and any energetics that we feel. Realizing, of course, that for some people, energetics will be instantaneous. Some people, it'll occur after a longer period of time. Does not matter. We're all set up differently, so it should be different. Uh, smell this thing. Oh, my goodness. So I'm going to give you a clue. I'm not going to tell you exactly what the smell is, but I will tell you there's a difference between the smell of the leaves and the smell of the tea leaf. Okay, so what I'm trying to do is ascertain where in my mouth I'm getting a drying feeling. 
I am clear about that now. I'm thinking about the aftertaste. I had a little aftertaste already with this. For me, no energetics yet. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe I'm starting a little energetics. But it wasn't as instantaneous as red tea is for me. I actually am getting some energetics now. Let's go ahead and take a second one. Okay, I have a pretty good idea of a starting point with this tea. So I'm gonna have Xiaobei go ahead and brew with you. So remember that your water should be 175 degrees. You should set your timer to two minutes. Xiaobei's cleaning up this half hour and make sure that everything is clean and fresh. And I'm continuing with what happens after they start to wither. So no matter what, after picking, you wither the tea. So in this particular farmer's case, he actually does wither for between three and four hours, or he did for this one. And remember, year after year, it's a little different. After withering, what do you do with green tea? With green tea, you immediately apply heat. And what you're trying to do is to denature the enzyme which causes oxidation. So you want to apply over 150 degree heat. And usually they apply between three and 400 degree heat. With yellow tea, it's the same thing. Oh, except they don't do it as long. They usually get through that process in six or seven minutes. So it's fast. It's very fast. And whoever is doing that is doing it usually by hand. You usually don't have, if there's so little yellow tea made, usually it's all by hand. All right, so you clean the glasses, get the baggie out, Put in the tea. You're going to shake it. Take a little smell. Pour in the water and set your time. Make sure your other cup is heated. Great. All right, so why, after you do the denaturing of the enzyme, is, is there a difference at this point between green and yellow tea? Really not much of a difference. And remembering whoever invented this was working off of doing green tea first. So all these steps are identical, although they use a shorter time to actually, uh, to actually denature the enzyme. After denaturing it, they let it rest for about 30 minutes, and then they pack it away. Now, there's many different modalities, many different ways to pack it away. So Junshan Needle, They've talked about this before. They have some special paper. They wrap it in one or two pound packages, and then uh, they put it in a special room that is has a certain humidity and a certain temperature. Yes. Leaf aromas, tight, dark, dry leaves, smelled fresh mown grasses, wet leaves, malty, and a green tea scent. Great description. So particularly of the wet tea, Malty, I like your lead in with that. Uh, a little bit grassy, the dry leaves grassy, and a mown lawn, is that correct? Good, good start, excellent start, particularly with that lead off of, of malty. So after that 30 minutes, ah, never mind. 
two minutes is expired. You're going to separate the tea leaves from the tea liquor. Not in a hurry, you're not going to spill it everywhere. You're going to make sure all the liquid is out because you're going to get a nice second steeping with this. And then you're going to enter the quality arena. And yours should look this color. So if it doesn't look this color, then something has happened. Something has gone awry. All right, so go ahead and enter the quality arena. So we're smelling the wet leaves. And now you're going to take a sip. And you're going to do several things. Because remember, you're not thinking first about taste. You're really thinking mouthfeel. How is it interacting in my mouth? Again, the drying feeling somewhere, is it extreme drying or is it light drying? How's the density of this tea? Is it pretty light <clears throat> or is it heavier? And what sort of aftertaste is there? and to be aware also of energetics. <clears throat> so while you're thinking of this, I'll continue with the process. So you wrap it in something, either special paper or cloth or bamboo. And this is really driven by where you're producing it. Junshan, it's the paper. In this area, it's cloth. In Sichuan, it's bamboo. So you have different modalities, but you're doing the same thing. Now I get to use a big word. And this big word is going to be important because this is what's causing auto oxidation. That's one big word. That's not the big word I was really going to use. I'm going to use thermalization. And we'll talk specifically. Yes. The aftertaste to me is very fresh has that lighter, fresh taste and feeling of a green tea. Reminds me a bit of Japanese sencha, but a more robust version. Oh my goodness. This is a good description. So the aftertaste is, what was the first adjective used? Light is fresh, very fresh. Uh, fresh, very fresh, uh, a little bit on the lighter and a hint of roast in this reminding this particular commentator almost of sunshine, a sunshine, although lighter. And the reason I like that is typically sunshine, that's a Japanese tea, uh, would have a roast to it and it wouldn't be dissimilar to this. So I, I do like that comment. The comment, the scent mellows from steep leaves to tea liquor and the components of the scent are more blended. Love this comment. The scent mellows from tea leaves to tea liquor. You guys picked it up because I told you that it was different between the tea leaves and the tea liquor. And it, yes, it is that mellowing of the scent. It's, it's not in your face. The tea leaves is in your face. Uh, strong mouth activation and cooling. Strong mouth activation and cooling. There is, and, and great way that you said it, because mouth activation, you didn't fall into the trap of saying, well, strong astringency. There isn't strong astringency. There is astringency, but it's not strong. But strong mouth activation and absolutely cooling. All right. Hey, you can keep the comments coming, but I'll keep talking while you're thinking about it. So no matter what, 
thermalization plays a key role in oxidation of this tea. Now, again, on the internet, sometimes you see this process of tea compared to Wulong tea. That's a bad comparison. Should not be compared to Wulong tea. I understand why people sometimes make that, but it's not really close. The thermalization here refers to two types of thermalization, doesn't it? And when I go through the whole process, you'll understand. One is dry heat, which influences the actual taste. And the other is wet heat, which influences the aroma. So you have these two things going on and they, in quotes, there's a Chinese saying about this. Not a saying, it's a description. Mun Hong, trap in the yellow. Well, what's trapping in the yellow? It's this thermalization and both the dry and the wet. And whoever figured this out was brilliant. Whichever monks did this was brilliant because, again, one influences the flavor and the other influences the aroma. Yeah. For the lightness of the hue, there is a noticeable contrast in that there is definitely viscosity in the mouthfeel more than I'd imagine given how it presents visually. So this is a, a comment about visual presentation, which is relatively light versus the actual viscosity, which is relatively heavier. So there's a contradiction. It's not really a contradiction. There's something that doesn't meet the eye ex eyes expectation. And great comment on that. The wet leaves have delicate, subtle aroma, sweet and hint of tartness at the beginning and toward the end, a sweet corn. Oh my goodness. A, another great description. And uh, I'll tell you why I love this description in a minute. So the, we're talking about the leaves, right? Yes. Yes. So the leaves have a hint of sweetness in the beginning and then a little bit of tartness and then at the end, sweet corn. And sweet corn is the right place to be because there's this agricultural product combined with a sweetness. And remember, we've already from the very beginning started to hook this all up by using the term malty. And so there is a continuity in all these comments and you're pulling it apart very nicely. Okay. Absolutely on the right track with everything here. And this is a hard T if you're not used to going through this process. And obviously you guys are real experts, so it's, it's going quickly and easily. Yes. Yeah, uh, I get a sense of quote oil texture and I get a sense of a subtle butter that maybe that is the sweet corn. So a scent of oil texture and a scent, subtle scent uh, or hint of butter. And again, all of these comments fall in line. There's nothing that's contradicting previous comments. Oil and butter, sweet corn, malty, all of this is occurring within this tea. And now I can say a summation of this, which is yellow teas in this style tend to have all these attributes that you're bringing up. So great job for capturing this. Another, another compare with Japanese tea with the hojicha, the roasted green tea, but this tea uh, is, is juicy where the hojicha is more dry. So great, another great comparison and it's driven by roastiness. There is some roastiness in this tea. It's compared to hojicha, which is another Japanese tea that's roasted. The roast is heavier in hojicha, and the tea liquor is more drying, according to this commentator, but here it's juicy. And this is absolutely a good capture of this. This is juicy. So again, as we're processing, remember I said we wrap it 
and we put it in a heat controlled humid room. What else do we do? I don't do anything. What else does the farmer do? The farmer for some of these yellows applies a little bit of water to the outside and it's, it's in a steam form or a mist form uh, to the outsides of the packages. Mm -hmm. That's not every yellow tea, but for this particular one, there's a little bit applied. And what is the temperature that this tea is kept in, in these packages? The, the temperature in this particular room is about 81, 82, degree, 81, 82 degrees. And the humidity level is relatively hot. So it's sealing in the yellow, so to speak. And the flavor of the yellow is everything that you have pointed out. So when they put these packages in, how long do they leave them there? They leave them for a couple of hours, take them out, and then usually unwrap the packages, mix all the tea together, tea leaves together, and then re-roast lightly. So what temperature are you, they using for a re-roast? They're using somewhere around 200 degrees, 210. And it's not for a long time. It's just, again, to seal in the yellow with the dry heat. Finish, then you put it back, wrap it again. Oh my God, and you keep it stored. And wow. This sounds like a lot of work. If I'm a farmer, why in the world am I working so hard? Don't I want to, you know, be a little lazy or work a little less? Yes. What are they wrapping it in? So there's three possibilities. The question is whether they wrap it in. They're either wrapping it in this special paper, which you would probably associate with wax paper but not this tea. They're wrapping it in cloth, cotton cloth, or which is this one, or bamboo, which is some of the tea farmers in, in Sichuan. So it's different by farmer and different by area, but they're wrapping it in something and it's smaller packages. So how long do they do this process of two hours in, you know, take it apart, mix it, re-roast, wrap again? It depends where you are. So with Junsha and Neil, they do it over a three-day period. Three days and three nights. No rest for the farmer. With this tea, they're doing it in a three-day process. Truly no rest for the farmer. At the conclusion of that, what do they do? What must they do? And you know from what I described what they have to do because they're dampening, they're, it's in a humid environment. They gotta reduce that water content because if they don't, these tea leaves will mold, will mold. So at the end, they have a more extended, slightly hotter roasting of the tea. So many of you got that light roast in here. There is a light roast because there's repeated applications of heat, especially the dry heat. Yes. Back to the, the tasting. Uh, grassy and viscous are the words, all in moderation for an interesting experience. Grassy and viscous in moderation for an interesting experience. I like the in moderation. So this commentator is thinking in their head, okay, I drink Chara, I drink Emerald Gates. What's the difference again? And they're making this type of comparison. There is some grassiness and there's definitely viscous, but it's not over the top. It's not the primary direction of this tea. Malty, slightly sweet, sweet corn, oil, buttery, all, and, and a little roasty, all fits this tea. You know this is really yellow tea. Is this that mysterious, especially now that I've gone through the process? Yes. This tea might be a good tea to sit down with the 
other side, quote, prior to starting negotiations, <laughs> so that each side starts out with a common base and one for which there might be a blank slate. <laughs> uh, so this commentator has a very creative mind and has suggested that, you know, what should happen is you should lock Putin and Zelensky in a room and serve this tea. So both of them have to, you know, do some thinking and some backing up and comparison. And they talk to each other and they get in a rhythm and then talk peace. Great comment. Interestingly, the infused leaves give off a whiff of floral fragrance, just a nice whiff that wraps its delicate, subtle aroma. So this is the magic about this tea. The commentator notes that there is just this subtle hint of floral. Now, remembering that we all as tasters and smellers take floral and sweet and fruity all in the same breath. And so while some of us may say sweet, others will say slightly floral or slightly honey knife or slightly fruity. And this is how I take that comment. And so it's very appropriate. It works in this context. So I ask you this, given now what you know about this process. If I were a farmer in one of these regions, why wouldn't I think to myself, golly, this is hard. You know what? I'm going to just take this varietal and I'm going to just do a green tea, roast it a little extra, and then I'm going to put it on the market as yellow tea. Do you think that this ever happens? Now, knowing that this world has LCSs, we know it happens. And there is a way to explain it in the Chinese market. And so they have a term for green needle or yellow needle. That's the direct translation. And the green needle describes a farmer who's done just precisely that. And most consumers in the West have a very, very hard time telling the difference because most consumers in the West don't get true yellow tea. You've gotten the true yellow tea and you can see even better than see. You can taste the difference between yellow and green tea. And this is the value that you get today from tasting uh, this tea, yes. There's another comment on the corn, but this is about the, the tea liquor. Uh, it also gives out the corn, sweet corn aroma, but not as much as the wet leaves. It's, it's more gentle. Love this comment. So the subtleness of the corn in the tea liquor is different from the outright aggressiveness of the corn maltiness in the tea leaves. There is no question that immediately you can detect that in the leaves, but you kind of have to taste into this a little bit to catch it into the liquor. But once you detect it, you can't leave it. It's that distinct. So again, when you are tasting yellow tea, this is really, and the reason we wanted you to do Siren Song is because this is like representative. You've now had a really, really fine yellow tea with all the subtleties. Next week with Old Gold, you're gonna taste another direction, but don't forget this primary direction that you tasted this week. So, um, Going back to the farmers, and let's make sure, oh, wow, for a change, I haven't over-talked. Uh, let's make sure that I go back and talk about, again, this green needle versus yellow needle. Because as a farmer, realizing that most consumers don't have a true understanding of yellow tea, you think to yourself, 
if you're this type of farmer, you think to yourself, okay, you know, I like spending more time with my family, I, but I also like the big money. So if I just put it out there, and since nobody really except the local people understand, I can get the most, best of both worlds, spend lots of time with my family and make lots of money. That's great until you run into tea drinkers like you who understand now that there is definitely a difference. Is yellow tea common in China? The answer is no. It's not common anywhere. Not much is made. And that's exactly why you have this issue of so much of it on the market, particularly outside of the areas where it's grown, that is not the real thing. And, you know, it's really unfair of me to state it that way. Let me state it in the correct way. It hasn't gone through the full yellow tea process. This doesn't mean that the underlying varietal isn't good. It's great. If you make it in the green tea process and you market it as this is green tea from this area, it's still delicious. And the really honest farmers do do that because they just simply don't want to go through the time and or think about how I described this just a minute ago. You're wrapping it in two pound packages or a pound package. You're having to put in a special room. You got to have equipment. You got to have space. If you don't have the equipment or the space, then you just say to yourself, okay, I'm going to just do this as green tea. Market it as that, and that's fine. The whole issue comes when you try and pretend that it's yellow tea. Remembering that yellow tea is some of the most premium tea in China. The top rated Junshan needle, which again, we've done in a previous session, that stuff goes easily, easily for $50,000 a pound. So that's one of the reasons that the main producers of that work so hard to control the market. In other words, they scour the entire Chinese tea market for scams with that tea. This producer scours the local market, but they don't have the resources to scour the whole country. Yes. Uh, this tea is smooth all the way with some astringency down the throat. The sweetness lingers in the mouth and that's refreshing and cleansing. I love how it smells and tastes good at the same time as I sip this beautiful delicate tea. Great comment. So this is a comment about this tea as being smooth and sweet and a little bit astringent as it goes down the throat. And overall, it's delicate and a good tasting tea as you're going through it. This beautiful tea makes me feel beautiful too. Ah, this beautiful tea makes me feel beautiful too. A commentator notes, I feel beautiful also when I drink this tea. Uh, let's all drink more of this. Uh, well, gosh, you guys are already beautiful. You don't need to drink anymore. Just me. I need to drink more. So this is the difference between the yellow and the green. And that's why I've spent so much time trying to get you focused on this. Because, again, you'll see lots of tea advertised on the market. And by the way, the other appellation, appellation that you see on uh, advertised tea in the market is you'll have honest farmers who say um, the tea varietal is associated with yellow tea. They've done it in a green tea style using yellow tea elements. And that's actually a fair statement. In fact, that's a very accurate statement because some of them may actually wrap one time. So for a two hour period, then roast and then put it on the market. So is that technically yellow tea? 
Uh, you could say it is. And particularly when they pr uh, present it like that, then that's okay because you know, okay, that there's elements of both going on. And remembering, let's back this up again because I started off by telling you what you leave today with, which is the elimination of mystery about yellow tea. By the way, that those were not my words. My marketing person has a great sense of imagination. So when you saw mysterious yellow tea was the same time I saw mysterious yellow tea. And hence, I wanted to take that mystery out. And remembering that the key element here is thermalization. You hear some people say, oh, it's got some fermentation. The answer is no. It is oxidized, lightly oxidized. What about the health benefits? Oh my God, if you go in the yellow tea region, they list 12 or 13 health benefits. The Japanese would tell you that this tea is great for the liver. And they've actually done some better research about this. The Chinese are doing a lot of research now. And basically what's coming out of that research is the following. You're hearing that many of the benefits of green tea are also in yellow tea with the difference being that since yellow, the, the yellow is smothered, uh, smothered, that's a bad term. That's the accurate translation of that word. But since the yellow is accentuated, there we go, in the aroma profile and in the actual taste profile, when they go through the full process, it is actually much easier on the stomach. So one of the things you hear all the time about this tea is it's good for IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And all I would say about this, this is an allegation, by the way, I'm not presenting, remember, I'm not a doctor or researcher, you know, I'm an understudy and that's it. And the IBS allegation, here's what I'd say for sure is true, that yellow tea is easier on the stomach than green tea. Somehow this process reduces the harshness of the poly polyphenols that some people feel. On an empty stomach, some people get nauseated drinking green tea. You would not get nauseated drinking this tea on an empty stomach. It, the, this process uh, mediates that. Okay, uh, I have gone on for a change less than the maximal amount of time. And oh, go ahead. Is there a difference in the caffeine content of green and yellow tea? So the questioner asked, is there a difference in the green, I'm sorry, in the caffeine content between green and yellow tea? So remembering the general rule is as follows. The more you process any plant, the less caffeine there is. This is processed more than green tea, so it will have less caffeine. The other thing that this process seems to do is take out the other stimulative factors that green tea have. In the order of caffeine, we know it's white tea, green tea, and blah, blah, blah. However, in the order of stimulative tea, it's green tea first. Green tea seems to produce more stimulation than any other tea. And that may have to do with how it interacts with your stomach as well. Clearly there's a relationship there. This is very gentle on the stomach. This is easy uh, for everybody to consume without an after effect. And this, by the way, if you want to impress friends. So let's say that you're going to hold a nice brunch party uh, for a set of important friends and you want to impress them, how about a yellow tea? How about siren song? Because none of your friends will have had this. And then they'll all ask you, yellow tea, I've never heard of such a thing. What does that mean? And remembering 
the key large word, actually you can use two large words. One of them is thermalization. And what does that mean again? Dry heat and wet heat, that's all it means. And then you have this other big word, which even sounds scientific, auto oxidation. And again, what that means is there is an element during the process which causes oxidation, which is not the enzyme. What is that element? That element is water. That element is that uh, dampness. It's hydrolysis, which occurs, and that causes slight oxidation. And oxidation, as soon as you do slight oxidation, that always is going to change the flavor profile of any tea leaf that you're working with. So you can use those two big words and everybody will say, God, you really know your teas. And the truth of the matter is all of you really do know your teas. All right. You guys are fabulous. I didn't realize that you were gonna taste down into these flavor profiles so fast. Yes. Does the farmer put the water on the wrapping? So the question is where in the world does the farmer put the water during the humid, uh, the stage where it's heated in the humid room and it's, it's sprayed on, it's misted on, that's what I should say. Occasionally it will be steamed, uh, uh, very lightly steamed. This isn't a, a heavy steam. And so there's two issues here. One is you ask, is it directed onto the surface of the wrapping. So if it's misted, very often the answer is yes. Yes, if it's steamed, very often the answer is no. But actually we're aware of situations in both cases, but almost never, excuse me, would you mist leaves. You almost would never ever do that because it's hard to handle leaves when you get water on that's not for a heat purpose. So what do I mean by that? In Japan, what do they do to denature the enzyme, the oxidation enzyme? They steam it. And so yes, of course it gets water on, but then they immediately dry it afterwards. That's why in this case, by putting the water on the wrapping, what you're doing is you're promoting this trapping the yellow and getting that effect to go in the uh, humidified uh, rooms. But you're not really wanting those leaves to be full of moisture because at some point you're gonna have to get rid of that moisture. And that's probably why every two hours or so they unwrap everything, they re-roast because they're getting rid of that moisture. Down to the last sip, this tea makes me just want to relax. An invitation to slow down and go with the flow of life. That's exactly what I'm going to do this weekend and have more of this tea. <laughs> Great comment. So this tea, down to the last drop, according to this commentator, allows them to relax. And it's an invitation, actually. The tea is an invitation to get mellow, to relax, it just puts you in that frame of mind. And that's what this commentator is going to do is they drink more of this this week. All right. Again, fabulous session with you. It's so easy to do these sessions now with you because you really stay within the guardrails. You are aware of the quality arena. You make wonderful, astute comments about it. And now you really have the ability to go out and understand what yellow tea is in a way that no, almost no other tea purveyor understands because there just isn't much documentary material on yellow tea. And if we've only seen portions of the process, the process is so darn, darn long. We can't stay at a farm for three days. I guess we could. And Today, I actually, as I was preparing for this session, was regretting, gosh, 10 years ago, we had a chance to do that. Why didn't we do that? Well, we were busy. And three days is a long time to be on one farm. 
So at any rate, I salute all of you for the great observations, the wonderful sense, thoughtful sense of how you detected flavors and aromas and just the thoroughness of how you went through the quality arena. Yes. Two comments. One, just this commenter doesn't normally like yellow tea, but this one very much likes it. The second question is why is there not a lot of yellow tea out there? So two comments. One, the commentator didn't usually doesn't like yellow tea, but loves this one. Second comment is, okay, if this darn thing is this good, why in the world isn't 50% of the Chinese tea market yellow tea? Well, I'll tell you why. It's hard to do. It's an insider's tea. And the, you have to have the right equipment. It doesn't lend itself to be industrialized. Red tea slash black tea lends itself to be industrialized. Yellow tea absolutely doesn't. Almost all yellow tea has uh, is is handcrafted. By and large, most of the way through. By the way, I realize as I'm thinking about the, the process I described to you, one of the things I left out between uh, stopping oxidation at the beginning. Uh, through heat and then resting the leaves for 30 minutes. And before you wrap it, some producers, including this one, actually roll the tea leaves. I apologize. I left that out and it just crossed my mind as I was reviewing internally what I told you. So that's one step I left out. Why the choice yellow? Why call it yellow tea? Why call it yellow tea? Because the two things. This is a great question. In the beginning, I didn't quite understand this. So they have this term, trap the yellow, and the tea liquor in some yellow teas is very, very yellow. And But more importantly, the leaves themselves sometimes can get very, very yellow. So it took on that name. You, you, not all of it uh, becomes that yellow, but some of it does, and that's why it's called yellow tea. All right. I think I'm finished. You guys have a very, very wonderful week. Stay safe this week. Remember next week, we're going to do old Go. Look forward to seeing you next week. Oh, and one more thing. I have to thank my production crew. My production crew. You, you might have thought that that was my sister with a deep voice. It was not. Jonathan, with the aid of Terry, who just came back from France yesterday or the day before. Oh, la la. Oh, la la is right. Help make this production a great success today. So I thank, thank you, you both thank you. and look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care now. Bye-bye.